Shalom Chavrim. I'm Stephen Ben Danoon, and you're watching Danoon Institute of Biblical Research, a production of IsraelReturns.com. And we are starting the series here on the book of Matthew. Now, I'll probably take, I won't do it tonight, because I, this is going to be more of a shorter lesson here, but very interesting, I think you'll find. Um, excuse me. Um, not every chapter we'll be covering. Uh, I'm mainly going to take and speak to you about certain passages that I'm finding in certain chapters uh, through the, uh, the Hebrew Matthew here that uh, I think you'll find very interesting. Uh, it, it sheds some light on the identity of Yeshua, who he really is, uh, and it really gives a more in-depth understanding of when we read that he spoke with authority like no other, you'll really get a better appreciation uh, for this as well. So, um, and, and like I said, I, I, I wanted to, uh, I'm, I'll, I'll go through the, the um, I'm going to take you through a little bit later, not, not on the first message here, but I will take you through um, some more of the, how would I say, authentication, uh, authentic, authentic, uh, 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 authenticating this particular version of, of Matthew's gospel as being one of the most accurate in, in what historians have said, what uh, scholars have said about it. And, and, and of course, as I'm reading it, uh, and I, I really have been more and more convinced that, yes, this is really a very accurate uh, um, uh, way of reading Matthew. Uh, it's, we know it from first century uh, uh, writers, uh, as they are called early Christian fathers, that they said that Matthew did write uh, in the, uh, the gospel in the Hebrew language. And, uh, and of course, we'll, we'll go into that a little bit later. Anyhow, let's get started, though. Uh, I'm going to skip over chapter 1 and chapter 2. There's pretty much... Uh, consistent throughout there. There are there are things that are there or not there, but it's more simplistic there. Than, uh, so therefore, I probably won't go into that as much uh, as in other chapters, things that I feel like that would really be uh, very, very, very important for you to know um, in, in regarding some of the key, key elements here. So we're going to go right into chapter 3. And, um, and I trust this is a blessing to you here. I actually was... And several other things I want to talk to you about with this, but then Satan has really been trying to deal with me physically. Uh, I had to leave camera here several times because of just some pains that I'm dealing with in my body, but <clears throat> I don't care. I don't like the devil. He doesn't like me, so we have a mutual uh, hatred for one another. Uh, anyway, let's take a look at uh, chapter 3. I'd like to first go to verse 9 says, do not say in your heart, Abraham, uh, well, you know what, I'm, I'm going to take and, and, and read these for you first from King James, what we're typically used to. So chapter 3, verse 9, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able to these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now that's what we have from the Greek translation in English uh, in King James. And Matthew writes here, Do not say in your heart, Abraham is our father. Truly I say to you that God is able to raise up his son Abraham from these stones. Now, that's quite a bit different. And uh, I don't really know what to think about that at this point here, but, but it's what he does say, even in the Hebrew. Uh, Ben of Abraham, mean of Avanim, Haele. So, <clears throat> but I just thought I'd bring that out because it, 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 there is a difference there, and I thought it was important, something that you might be interested in, in knowing there. Um, if you go on down to verse 11, this is where we get into the baptism, uh, where John is baptizing. Another interesting point here in chapter, uh, excuse me, chapter 3, verse 11. And King James has it recorded like this. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, 
whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, that sounds like that there's two different things that Jesus will baptize with, the Holy Ghost and with fire, if you read it literally right there. Now, the word with is actually italicized in the Greek, so if you were to take the word with out, because that just means that word wasn't there, it would actually read, baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Okay, still though, you've got the conjunction and adding it on there as if it's two different things. All right, well, that's, we could say that's reasonable in one regard, but let's see how it's written here, <clears throat> the way that uh, Matthew wrote it. Ve'yuhu tovil etchem be'esh ruach ha'kodesh. Now that is different. It's a little bit different. It's more of a description. Okay, so let's read from John 11, or excuse me, verse 11, chapter 3. John answered all of them, Behold, I truly baptize you in the days of repentance. But another comes mightier than I, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to unfasten. He will baptize you with the fire of the Holy Ghost. Now, literally, Be'esh Ruach HaKodesh, in fire of the Holy Ghost. So, not baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire, but with the fire of the Holy Ghost. Now, the reason why that's a little different and why I feel like it's more accurate when we read this here in the Matthew language here is because you have to remember what did John, or excuse me, what did uh, Adam and Eve have in the very beginning? They had the fire of of Hashem, the fire of the Holy Ghost inside of them. They were called Ish and Isha. And that's what he says here, Be'esh, which remember Adam's name is a compound, or he was called first Ish, which is compound, Aleph Yod Shin, taking the Yod out, leaving Aleph Shin. That's the fire, the fire of what? The Yod represents God's divine name. He had the fire of Yahweh, or the fire of the Holy Spirit inside of him. And that's what I thought was very interesting. So, all right, so let's move a little further here. And, um, <clears throat> we, of course, you know, he, he, uh, John does ask the question. Uh, he says, uh, in verse 14, but John was doubtful about baptizing him and said, I should be baptized by you and you come to me. Jesus answered and said to him, permit it because we are obli obliged to fulfill all righteousness. Then John baptized him, and that's pretty consistent with one another on that. Now, we get into chapter 4, and this is where things really begin to come, become interesting. Now, what I found in reading these things is that it's not just interesting, it's consistent with a theme. And this is something that you'll see in a moment that I found very fascinating. Not just the fact of the water baptism and things, but the purpose of, of, of the things that happen. Uh, there, thereafter, where his ministry begins, everything is not coincidental. It's all for a reason. Okay, in chapter 4, this, uh, when Jesus, excuse me, then Jesus was taken uh, by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Okay, that's verse 1, and let's just take it in King James. Let's see how we have here. Let me just read the whole thing real quick, or a portion of it. Then was Jesus led up by the Spirit, led up of the Spirit, excuse me, and to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, that is, Yeshua answers and says, uh, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Okay, verse 5, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle in the te of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give the angels charge over, uh, concerning thee, and in, in uh, their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou should dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written 
Again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Actually uses God's divine name uh, in that regard there. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceedingly high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give, to, give if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith uh, Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. All right now. Let's see how Matthew actually writes this. Very interesting here. He says here, Then Jesus was taken by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Okay, as la as la as levekach Yeshua Baruch Hakodesh. Okay, Baruch Hakodesh actually is the the Baruch Hakodesh. That's right, the Holy Spirit led me to bar into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. He fasted forty days and forty nights. Afterwards, was hungry. The tempter drew near and said to him, Okay. It's pretty pretty consistent thus far, and uh, and it's I guess it seems to be very obvious that Satan is not necessarily tempting him. Why he's fasting in forty days and forty nights in the wilderness? It seems more so. Um, uh, I mean, I mean, of course, we know the scripture says he was taken out by the Holy Spirit to be tempted, but it seems like the particular temptation we're seeing here is appears to be afterward. Maybe not. Maybe it's during the time, but it's just kind of interesting. Um, and said to him, if you are the son of God, say that these stones should be, sh should turn into bread. Okay. That's verse three. Okay. Uh, and, and Hebrew, he does ask him, you know, the yomet lo im, im, meaning if, if, im Elohim uh, ata, if you, excuse me, im ben Elohim ata, if you be the son of God. See, and that's exactly what he says. If you be the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Jesus answered and said to him, it is written, not by bread alone. Now, the gav, uh, or the gav is what he says after the word alone. Uh, lavado, oh my gosh, how do I have a telephone in here? Sorry about that, guys. Uh, so anyway, he's, he says, uh, which basically is a word that they translate as etc. It was, really was a word that I'm not familiar with myself. Um, so undoubtedly, you know, it, well, if he's quoting the scripture, and there's nothing wrong with King James adding the rest of that in there because he is actually quoting from the scripture on that. The next verse, verse 5, is when it starts to get interesting though. Then Satan took him uh, to the holy city, placed him on the highest point in all the temple, and said to him, verse 6, If you are God, jump down, for it is written, He has commanded His angels in regards to you to keep you in all your ways. Hmm. Now, did you notice the difference there? In chapter 3, I mean, excuse me, in chapter 4, verse 3, he says, If you are the Son of God, say that these stones should be turned into bread. Okay? That's verse 3. The Yom Lord im bin Elohim ata. Say, if you are the Son of God. But when you get to verse 6, he doesn't ask it that way. In verse 6, he says, The Yom Elev im Elohim ata. Daleg. Daleg is actually like skip. Just skip right off of here. If you be God. You know what I find that was interesting here? Satan wasn't really sure. He's asking the question, if, if you be, if, if, everything is an if. So first he asks, if you're the son of God. Why? Because he knows a virgin shall conceive. He knows there is the son of David. He knows that God came to Abraham in the form of a man. 
And he, you see, he knows that God came before Moses at the burning bush. So he's not really sure about this man, Yeshua. He knows what the prophecies are written there, so he comes to him and he's tempting him, trying to find out who he is. But I find it interesting. Why doesn't he ask him again the question of the Son of God? If thou be the Son of God. Now, we have that in King James. They put it over here, Son of God and the King James both times, but they've actually added to the word because it's not what Matthew says. The second time he asks him, he says, if you be God. If you be God. Just skip right off of here. See, he says, it's commanded his angels in regard to you to keep you in all your ways, etc. And Yeshua answered him, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You notice he didn't say it is written. Verse 7 in uh, the King James. Jesus said unto him, it is written again. See, when Matthew recorded it, he didn't say anything about that. In verse 7, it says, Ve'yon elav Yeshua shnit lo tanasei at chai alecha elochimcha, elochecha. He literally, not, he's saying God's divine name. It's, it's the shortened version of God's divine name. Tempt not, tempt not the Lord thy God. You shall not tempt the Lord thy God. So, Satan is tempting him. Do you understand what I'm saying? Satan is tempting Yeshua. And Yeshua doesn't say, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Because see, if you read it in the way Matthew's writing it here, it's like, okay, I can't do this because I will be tempting God if I do that. I, I mean, I don't know. It, it's It's... it's I would call it, let's call it a conjecture there. I mean, but just think about it. It's, it's kind of interesting. He's not, he's not quoting it as written. He's telling him flat out. So, just uh, very interesting thought to me. Very interesting. Um, so Satan took him exceedingly to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the earth and their glory, and said to him, all things I will give to you if you... Render unto me. See, like give an allegiance to me, pray unto me, worship unto me. Now, doesn't he doesn't use the word worship here? Um, he he literally does not. He does not use the word worship. He uses tagarua, uh, which is imtaruga uh, eli, which render is a good way. In other words, you give unto me. I know the translator here said, uh, bear your head unto me, but it's not what he says. He doesn't say bear his head unto him, but he's, he's showing that, you know, that you give over to me, you render to me, you give it to me. He's wanting him to forfeit it and not, not go by the way of the cross, undoubtedly, is what he's uh, suggesting here. Then Jesus, or excuse me, then uh, as Yeshua answered him, go Satan, that is Satanas, for it is written, I will pray to the Lord and him only, you will serve. Now, a lot could be said I mean, why? I mean, I, I, I can't. I, I see the littlest of details when I think about this. I mean, it's another reason why you know it's obvious that it wasn't uh, the Arabic language that was spoken in that day, because when uh, Matthew wants to affirm what was written here in verse eleven, uh, he literally says it in the Hebrew here when he says, "Oto um, hasatan vehine melachim kara." Excuse me. I think I'm, I went to the wrong verse. I'm sorry about that. Lost my place already, guys. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 10, verse 10. I, I knew I was reading something wrong here. Lo Yeshua lecha hasatan be'az she atanas. See, satanas. What is he doing here? He is doing it also in the Greek language. But he's speaking to Satan. Why would, why would Matthew write it like that? I, I really wondered about that. 
that is Satanus. Go, Satan, that is Satanus. I, 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 the reason why I wonder if you really want to know why is because Rome was in control there. Is it, is it that, did Jesus really say it that way? Go Satan? Did he actually say to him, go Satan? That is Satanus. Did he really say it quote unquote like that? And if so, could that have been a compound reference in there? Because he does one in Hebrew and one in Greek. And could there be a little reference in there in regards to the fact that Satan would come again against Israel? Satan incarnated in the Antichrist himself. It, just, again, a conjecture. I can't say that's so. It's just something of interest. Uh, so then Satan left him, and behold, angels drew near to him and ministered to him. Now, this is another thing that I find interesting. And I pulled up a verse in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. I just wanted to share this with you. Uh, this is something Peter was speaking about here, and it made me wonder about this as well. Wherein you greatly rejoice, uh, though now for a season, if need be, you are in the heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, now this is kind of interesting, Yeshua is being tempted by Satan, right? He's being tempted by Satan. He's told him to go, and now, after Satan has, has left him, Behold, angels drew, uh, drew near to him, and uh, we, they, they inject the word minister to him. It doesn't say the word minister. It doesn't have a word there. It just says drew near to, to him and to him. So it's, in, it's inferred that he, they, they minister. They're doing something. They're telling him something. So it, it made me think of a scripture in Peter. So I pulled the scripture up for you because I want to read this to you. Wherein you, uh, ye greatly rejoice... Through, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptation, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, and that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of uh, Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believe. Believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory." receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should, uh, that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in, in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desired to look into. Okay? Uh, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end of the grace that is in, that he brought unto you, at the, at the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach, of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I bring this up. The reason I do is because Peter is writing here that the angels long to know these things, to look into these things, and they didn't even know it. So my question is, is that, then Satan left him, and behold, angels drew near to him and ministered to him. Could these angels here, could, I mean, th this is, and forgive me, I'm not making a doctrine of this. I want you to really understand. It's not a doctrine. I'm just thinking out loud with you. Could that be, again, the two witnesses? Not the two witnesses of today. I'm talking about Moses and Elijah. I shouldn't call it two witnesses. Could that be Moses and Elijah? Because, you know, Moses and Elijah come to him, and this time, though, Peter, James, and John got to be a witness and see this vision, and they're, they're there to do what? To strengthen him. He just went through a hard time, and they're there to tell him what's going to happen. Okay? They're, they're letting Yeshua know what's, what's about to happen. And 
But just keep that in mind, just as a little thought. I'm not, I can't say that for sure. I just, I wonder if that might be the case because if the angels drew near to him and ministered to him, then how does that line up with the scripture here where it says, and the angels desire to look into these things? See, see, uh, to him it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Now see, who did the ministering? Unto, to whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things. Who? He's talking about the prophets of old. See, up here, verse 10 in 1 Peter, uh, chapter, 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Now, this is kind of new to me. So I'm not, like I said, this is not a doctrine. It's just you, you begin to wonder about things sometimes. You know, why is it like that? Because truly, even uh, when Samuel the prophet came up, he prophesies of what's going to happen to Saul and his sons, and it happens. We see also Moses and Elijah do come up, and they are there to minister to the needs of Yeshua during his time of temptation. That doesn't identify them here as that. And yes, there is a possibility it is heavenly angels from heaven like Michael or Gabriel. But the only reason I kind of question it is because I remember the scriptures here in 1 Peter would speak, speak about the angels they desire to look into these things and they didn't know it. It's not known until after he'd come and gone. That's the thing I'm kind of, that's why I was kind of curious about that. You know, could that have been something that was withheld uh, from the angels, and that would have been a little something different there. All right, anyway, enough of that. Uh, that's, like I said, just a conjecture. Don't make it into a doctrine, please. I, I, I don't mean it that way. I'm just sharing with you things as I see things uh, because I find it interesting. A lot of things like that for me I'll come across, and I, I don't like to make it a doctrine even for myself. I just find things interesting, and I just kind of weigh it out in the Scripture to see could this be this way or could it be that way? Not necessarily with an absolute in my mind, but just uh, really searching the Word of God because I want to know myself uh, what, what He's done. All right, now let's go over to, uh, we're still in chapter 4, and uh, uh, well, let's go, uh, verse 12. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus heard that John had been delivered up into prison, so he went into Gilgal. He passed by Nazareth and dwelt in Capernaum, and this is uh, maritime on the outskirts of the land of Zebulun. In order to fulfill that which Isaiah the prophet said, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Okay, now I'm sure we're not getting quite the same type of wording as we have here. Um, the land of the, yeah, yeah, that's pretty much the same. Uh, all right, now here's what I found that was interesting is where he goes to quoting the scripture from, uh, from uh, the Old Testament, the prophets there. In verse 16, it says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, a light has shined upon them. Henceforth, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus went along the shore of the Sea of Galilee and saw the two brothers, Shimon, who is called Simon, also called Petros, and Andre, whose brother casting their nets into the sea because they were fishermen. He said unto them, Come after me and I will make you fish for men. Now, here's why, uh, and we're going to close with this right here, but here's why I found this was very, very uh, exciting to me to read this part here. He says here in verse 16, and it's quoted right in the King James as well, A great light, those that dwell in the land of the deep darkness, a light has shined upon them in a land of deep darkness. Now, you guys cannot help but think, if, if you're like me, there's so many things that I can think about that go with that. I think of John, uh, in the book of John. Now, I don't have that one in the Hebrew language, but I see that 
Even Rome could not really pervert that very well because it was too hard for them to alter. But in John chapter 1, uh, verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. All right, we also know he says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. As I've shared with you guys so many times in the past, what was the first word that he actually says there in Genesis? Well, as far as when I say the first word he says, we know that it's written, Moses writes in here, Bela Sheep, Bela Elohim, Et Hashemaim, Et Haaretz, Haaretz, Hayata, Tohu, Vevohu, Vehoshek, Alpane, Tachum, Behuach, Alakim, Chafet, Alpane, Chamaim. Now, that's important for you to understand that right there. I, I guess that sounded easy for me to say, didn't it? For you to understand, right? Everybody's going like, uh, yeah, sure, we understand that. All right, this is what I'm trying to get you to see. All right, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, okay? Hashemaim, heavens, ve'et ha'aretz, and the earth, or the land. Ve'ha'aretz, the land, hayata tohu ve'vohu. It's, it's like a nothingness, okay? The land, there's just nothing there. Ve'choshech, and the darkness... By the way, if you'll notice, Hoshek and Nachash, there's a similarity in the words and the names there. Nachash is serpent. Hoshek, okay? The darkness and the darkness, Alpane, upon the face, Chatechum, uh, on the face of the deep. All right? Now, notice, though, where when he said, and the Bible says, when they come there, all right, he's given the prophecy here. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. They're walking in darkness. That's what was on the face of the earth was just darkness, right? And they, they see that they've seen a great light. This, those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, like at the very beginning, darkness had just covered the earth. A light has shined upon them. See? Henceforth, Jesus began to preach to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. All right? Now, notice what else he says here in Genesis. Going back to Belashit, Genesis. All right? So we know the, uh, the Hoshek, the darkness, Alpane Tachum, is the, covers the face of, of, of the, of the di deeps or the depths. Veruach Elohim and the Spirit of God, Merchafet, hovers or broods over, see, Merchafet, Alpanehamain, over the waters. Isn't it interesting that Yeshua's ministry began in a place that was considered darkness, and his ministry also began where he was over the waters? This is why he actually walked on the water. His ministry begins there. He's around the men that he's going to make fishers of men. They're dwelling, they're, they're, they're dwelling in an area of nothing but darkness and sin. And here comes Jesus. Their life, although they may see the sun up in the sky, but their lives are like it was in Genesis. And Satan himself, Nachash, it's caused this hoshech, darkness, to cover the whole face of the earth there, in that area, in that part of the land. And so God, in a similitude, is showing you in a parallel here, when he writes it through Matthew, that this land was full of darkness. He quotes it, and light has appeared. And it's over around the waters, the Sea of Galilee, where his ministry is, just like Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God is brooding over it. What's he doing when he's brooding? To bring forth life. And Yeshua came to Galilee first to bring forth life. I mean, think about this. It's incredible. And of course, we know Yeshua walked on the water. He only, you know why he walked on the water? He could have gotten the boat went with him. They needed to know that God was with them. That's why he walked on the water. Now, Merchafet and brooded out on the Hamaim. Then comes what John says in uh, uh, the, the, the epistle of John 1. 
See, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. What was the Word? Well, the Word was God. Well, we need to know what God said so we'll know what the Word is. What's the first word? The Yomer Elohim Yahiod, and He said, God. Light becomes manifested before you. You'll read, and God said, let there be light. Let there be, let there be. Oh my gosh. It's the worst word we could think of. Let there be. Eternity becomes existent among you. That's what Yeshua was. He was eternal God existent among you. In your presence, the, the eternal God came down. That light came down. That's why it says here, a great light shines in darkness. In the Genesis, it was a great light. John recognizes it. To be the light of men. Why? Because when, what was he doing? Brooding over, brooding over. Finally, he, he creates the earth, the, the life on the sea, and he, the fish, and he creates uh, the vegetation and the grass, and then he creates man. He's brooding life. Everywhere Yeshua goes, there's life. Jerusalem is going to blossom like a rose. Why? Because the very God of creation, His life is there. And so what happens? Then He takes and He forms this man from the dust to the ground. Ipav, be, be, pav. Um, oh gosh, let me, excuse me, I'll get it wrong if I'm not careful here. Lord, forgive me. He breathes into that nostrils of that man and he becomes a living soul. Literally, for his soul was the life of Almighty God. John said, and the life was the light of men. And when God made Adam and Eve, he called him Ish, the fire of God. He called her Isha, the fire of God, feminine. Hmm. So when John says, notice, because this all begins right here in, in Matthew, right there at the very beginning. So when Matthew is writing about, John says that he comes to him, I need to be baptized of you. I mean, he tell, first he tells him, he said, there's one coming. He said, I'm baptized into repentance. He said, but he will baptize you with the Fire of the Holy Ghost. Not Holy Ghost and with fire. The fire of the Holy Ghost. The same thing he baptized Adam with. And he called him Ish. The Ish, compound word. Ish, fire. The fire of God. And we read in Genesis, the Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God was the one that was there. The tree of life, the tree of life happens to be God Himself. He's a, in this case here, see, God can change whatever form He wants. Isn't it funny? Because that's what Satan was confused about. Are you the Son of God? Okay, if you're the Son of God, turn, turn, turn the stones into bread. Okay? Why? You Remember when Yeshua makes a comment, he says to them, when he's feeding the 5,000 with all the bread, he said, do you not remember the loaves and the fishes? They talk about our fathers eat manna from heaven. He says, I am that bread. See, Satan remembered what happened. He remembered what happened in the wilderness journey. And he wasn't sure about Moses. You have to understand, there is a huge... God did it so simply, but yet so well hid it from Satan. He just, he's not been able to figure this out. And you don't think Satan didn't have a trouble with this? We know he had trouble with it because later he's arguing with Gabriel about the body of Moses. He doesn't argue with Gabriel about the body of Moses nowhere in the Tanakh. Nowhere did he ever argue about the body of Moses in the Tanakh. And it's evident that something's bothering him because when Yeshua comes along, he saw what happened at this man's birth. He has Herod take and go kill all the boys two years old and down to try to kill him. He's troubled that this man 
Yeshua. And so he knows that when Moses was here, he fed the children of Israel in the wilderness journey, the bread. So he thinks, that's, I, I mean, really, I'm kind of curious to know sometimes. I'm really curious to know how does he know these things. All right, and, and, and I know it's got to be written in the Word because he wouldn't know it. I mean, right now, just, I, I know if I search through, God will show it to me and show me where it's at. But he knew that. That's why he says, if thou be the Son of God. He knew the Son of God had to be the bread of life because why? He's going to be born in Bethlehem, the house of God's bread. And Moses is, you know, all this bread over here in the, in the wilderness journey. So he says, if you're the son of God, turn the stones to bread. I, he just, I just need to say, I need a proof. Okay? And Jesus doesn't bow to his temptations. So then he asks him, if you're God, not son of God. King James writes son of God. That's not what he says. Matthew writes on there, if thou be God, Elohim, if you be Elohim, then just skip right off the top of the pinnacle here. He's trying to figure it out. And then he argues with Gabriel over the body of Moses. When? After the resurrection. Now some people might say, oh, Satan knew who it was because, you know, when the people that were possessed of the devil says, thou son of Jesus, you know, have you come to torment us before, us, before our time? What? Uh, obviously he begins to realize who he is. There's no doubt about it. But in the temptation, he's not sure. It's a new guy on the scene. But he argues about that body of Moses. Because see, Moses didn't see corruption, and neither did Jesus. And that really threw him off. And if you notice in the ministry of Moses and the ministry of Yeshua, the parallels are ironic. And that's, so that's why then... Satan goes to argue with Gabriel about the body of Moses. Wait a minute, only one is supposed to not see. He says, my holy one shall not see corruption. And so no doubt Satan is before Gabriel saying, he says, my holy one won't see corruption. That's just one. Why do you got two? That's why Gabriel just shuts him off. Shuts him up. I trust this has been a blessing to you today. And we sure love you guys here. Uh, please keep us in prayer. And, uh, and, and if you would, just remember us that uh, we, are, we are going back to Israel here. Uh, the time is getting much closer now. Uh, we do have a little bit longer here, uh, another couple of weeks, uh, or just a little over two weeks here before we actually head back home. And uh, if you feel in your heart, if God leads you in your heart to support this ministry, remember our desire is to get the gospel to the Jewish people. And there are, you'd be surprised as you're watching this video, how many Jews there are that are watching this with you even now. Jewish people from Israel, Jewish people that are not even believers as of yet, but have written us and are asking more to know, why do we believe the way we do? So we know that it has an impact on people's lives. And we ask you to partner with us. Be a part of that. Be a part of seeing the gospel of Yeshua. Go to the Jewish people. We have fully dedicated our lives to the Lord and to the ministry, to God's work. I do not physically move pianos any longer. I have done it as long as I could. Uh, I actually did it all the way to the point where finally even the doctors say that it, I must stop. Uh, mainly because I've always wanted to provide for my family. And, uh, but yet the Lord seems to be pushing me as well to take the gospel to His people. I don't know what that means. I don't understand the capacity. I don't add to it or take from it. But I do know that he's also called you to be a part of that with us. We do this together as a body of Christ. So if you feel in your heart to be a part of that, just take, you can log online, IsraelReturns.com, and you can make a donation there on our website. There's a donation button there. Or if you prefer to do it by check or money order, uh, you could easily do that by sending it to 12537 Gemstone Court, Fort Myers, Florida, 33913. The address will be on your screen and uh, as the video ends. And, and keep in mind, it's Denoon Institute, D-E-N-O-O-N Institute. 
God bless you. We love you. Thank you for all you do. And remember, as we travel, it'll only be more that we'll be producing uh, so that you guys can see what's going on in Israel as we keep up with Israeli news live and uh, especially in-depth teaching as we go. I want to make sure that you're constantly seeing what's happening in Israel, especially the current events. And we thank you for being a part of that with us. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem Hashem. Baruch Hashem Adonai. Good night. Laila Tov.